good afternoon and thank you so very much for your introduction. It, in, it is indeed a, a privilege. I feel very honored to have been asked by, by Kamla to moderate this session and to be part of this um, day four session here today. And uh, I'm really thrilled by all that is happening as far as corporate governance is concerned. I'm excited to be in the same virtual room with each of you. Uh, it makes me feel important and uh, I'm really delighted for all that has already transpired. And uh, I'm excited about what will transpire in the next few minutes because the two speakers we have today, the two panelists are men, you know, of great repute, uh, of renown in this country. But before I get into that, I just hope that, you know, wherever you are, you are experiencing a, a nice rainy day like I am here in Central Trinidad. And, um, you know, that you are enjoying it as well. You know, I remember, um, as a, a sportsman at one point in time, uh, listening to a radio commentary, I, I heard the commentator, one of them said that there are poodles of water after a torrential downpour. He said there are poodles of water on the outfield and his um, fellow commentator chimed in and said, yes, that's because it's raining cats and dogs. So here in Central Trinidad, we've, we've been having some rain today and I'm very thankful, you know, we need it, but you know, everything in moderation as well. Um, today, before we get into the discussion, we also want to say a special thanks to the companies that are involved in making this governance week possible. And um, we have Republic Bank as the gold sponsor and two bronze sponsors in Angostura and um, Price Waterhouse Coopers. So we want to say a special thanks to them as well, right? And um, Henry, you're very much on the ball. I didn't want to call anybody's name, but um, it's okay if you write it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's it's one of those things yes so we want to say a special thanks to our um wonderful sponsors you know sponsors are needed for most things and they have made this possible and we want to say a special thanks to them for coming on board i know it takes a lot of work to get these things going so i also want to recognize and and speak and pay you know um tribute to, to kamla and, and the, the work she has been doing with this institute, um, Caribbean Corporate, Go Corporate Governance, and really bringing to the fore um, governance in issues in Trinidad and Tobago, and in particularly so, given the COVID period that we have been experiencing. So thanks very much to her and to you attendees. You know, Again, what, what, what is the purpose of having a party if you have nobody to celebrate and party with? So thank you all for attending. Thank you all, your patience is required. But you know what we look forward to? Your input, your contribution. So continue to chat on the, um, you know, put your comments on the chat and let me, you know, impress upon you the importance of asking questions because the panelists today are men that we need to really not just absorb from them what they present, but we need to squeeze them a little bit so that they give a little bit more because there's so much locked up in them given their experiences that we need to draw it out. And one of the important things in life in order for us to continue to grow at all levels is asking the right questions. And we have men today who have consented to be part of this experience and to share with us their years of accumulated knowledge. And we must now, you know, you, you don't want to just go to the river and not be, do you? You don't want to have a thirst and see water and not drink. So here's the opportunity. So let's make use of it. I want to encourage you to do that. These two men today who are going to address us on the topic of the experience of independent external directors serving on family boards are men of repute in the corporate world. They are renowned across the region for their leadership, vision, and insights. These qualities have gained them recognition and promotions into the highest levels of corporate leadership. John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. And these gentlemen epitomizes what good corporate leadership is all about. They are distinguished and their decisive leadership in these challenging times is something that we can learn from. It is therefore indeed a pleasure of mine to introduce each of them to share with us today. I will first introduce both of them, but Dr. Rollins will speak or address us first, and then David will come in. But just to give you a little background, and gentlemen, 
let me ask that you forgive me for being as brief as I am going to be in this introduction, because if I should go through your respective bios, we will be here at 2.30 just listening to your long biography. So I'm going to just use some excerpts of it. Dr. Roland Bertrand, currently CEO of KC Confectionaries and former CEO of Trinidad Cement Limited. He's a principal consultant of Transformational Executive Services. It's a consultancy practice that offers coaching for high level employment. Uh, CEOs, directors, have you. Uh, the, the current company that he's in, KC Confectionery, is more than 100 years old. It's a family business and possibly the oldest confectionery in the region, the Caribbean region. He obtained his PhD from the University of Phoenix, and he has served on numerous boards, including the Stock Exchange of Trinidad and Tobago. He was a chairman of WASA, chairman of Trinidad Aggregate Products, Caribbean Court of Justice Trust Fund as well. Now, all work and no play makes Rollin a dull boy. So he has done like Cupid, he has sharpened his arrow, and he has renowned as a first-class archer, straight to the heart. Dr. Rollins, we welcome you and we thank you. Our next panelist, every time I hear the name David O'Brien, I think green, I think surgical. David doesn't know me personally, but I would have seen him around many times, especially at the Queen's Park over. He's executive director of the Massey Group of Companies, executive vice president, and chairman of the board of Massey Motors and Machines Business Portfolio, former president of the Chamber of Industry and Commerce in Trinidad and Tobago, and he's held directorship on numerous boards, in, including the Tourism Development Company and the North Central Regional Health Authority here in Trinidad. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome them. Gentlemen, the ball is in now your court, and I'd like to ask Dr. Rollins to Dr. Rollin to bowl, to bowl things off. Welcome. Thank you. You all can hear me, I hope. Yes, Good afternoon, can. everyone, and thank you um, very much for inviting me to share my thoughts this afternoon on a very interesting topic. Um, as you can see, uh, hear from my bio, um, of course, I have spent a long, a long part of my career in um, a publicly listed company, Trinidad Cement Limited, manufacturing um, enterprise um, that span the Caribbean and reporting to a slew of regulators, uh, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, Eastern Caribbean, as TCL was listed on all of these exchanges. Um, during my time at TCL, I, I served on a, one or two um, boards, uh, family-owned companies. But I, my current assignment, of course, is at uh, Casey Confectionery, where um, I am the first non-family um, CEO in the 100 year history of the company. So that sends you a message immediately that um, something happened to the succession. Um, and uh, this is why the board of directors, uh, dominated by family members, took a decision to bring me in and help me transition the company from um, CEOs have, who have always been family members to non, a non-family uh, member CEO. Um, and this has been a quite a fascinating uh, experience for me. Um, now, what my, my um, comments today uh, don't necessarily relate to Casey Confectionery. They relate to my experiences um, in the corporate world and serving on other family businesses. And as an independent director, um, serving on the board of family businesses, um, I have observed that, that uh, family businesses tend to, uh, board meetings tend to focus on a, a very limited agenda. Um, 
certainly the, what we heard from Elizabeth Cox earlier today suggests that this is not necessarily common. There are family uh, businesses that have um, um, developed very impressive structures, as she described. Um, that was a large conglomerate and um, with boards and subsidiary companies and, and, and very nicely integrated independent directors into their corporate governance structure. But my experience has been that um, family businesses, they tend to focus on sales, they tend to focus on profits, cash flow, dividends. And um, in terms of independent directors, they, they of course like to have a lawyer, um, if that's possible, and an accountant as non-family members. And generally the family members will be um, those involved in the business in various portfolios. And um, they, they, as a consequence, the conversation tends to, to rotate around um, very short-term issues and a very limited agenda. Now, of course, I'm coming from a different environment. I'm coming from an environment of, of a, a publicly listed regional corporation. And typically, a CEO's report that I would have presented um, as a TCL's group CEO would have included topics such as um, national and international economic highlights, um, occupational health and safety issues. Then you would look at the financial performance versus budget prior year, cash flows, balance sheet highlights, variance reports, age payables and receivables, cash flow reviews, debt servicing ratios and covenants, you know, market segment reports, key marketing initiatives, PR and image management, operational KPIs, benchmarking, energy efficiency, waste, human capital, absenteeism, training, turnover, discipline, grievances, union issues, collective bargaining, um, quality systems, customer complaints, materials management, purchasing and inventory, IT systems, and security breaches, uptime, um, security updates, intelligence and threat analysis, environmental performance, regulatory updates, review of KPIs, capital project status and recommendations, cost benefit, and outlook projections for sales and, and down the road, sometimes one year down the road in terms of um, looking at the, at the company uh, in, in, the, in terms of its future performance. So that is a world that I have come from into a world in which, um, you know, people are, directors are simply focused on uh, sales last month, what do we expect for sales uh, next month? What is the profit and loss like cash flow and some hint as to whether we'll get dividends for this year or not? And I think that this is where independent directors can play an important role because a company that starts off as a one man show, what I call the one man band, doing everything, the entrepreneur doing everything, um, chief cook and bottle washer, as that company grows, the, the levels of risk um, rise exponentially. And um, often unknown to the director, it, innocent um, ignorance is truly bliss because the, the, the person, the entrepreneur is growing the business and doesn't seem to realize um, that the levels of threats are taking place in a, a range of, of, of issues um, that the board needs to take into consideration. Now, of course, you can't, I can't take a publicly listed company governance structure with all the committees and everything and just drop it into a, a small, medium-sized family type business. Um, they will go running to the hills. What you need to do is slowly, in my view, tailor um, appropriate um, governance models, hint to others uh, about others that, that we could be looking at down the road. For example, um, I would start off by, you know, suggesting that financial risk is critical. Shouldn't we look at some sort of audit committee? You know, a couple of directors sit together and um, 
look at the whole question of our interaction with the external auditors and uh, making sure we keep a close eye on, on our risks with regard to um, financial exposures. So that is something that you can kind of bring in as a first committee. I mean, other companies have many other committees, um, uh, board committees, um, but that is something that, that you can kind of tailor um, in terms of going forward. So independent directors can, can, can bring to the attention of a family uh, run board, the whole issue. And I, I think it has to do with a lot of what I call peripheral issues that the family board does not seem to be aware of because of this narrow focus on sales and cash flow and profits. For example, um, information technology, um, the need to be constantly upgrading and ensuring. We are living in a world of, of cyber, um, um, cyber security. Um, you have um, ransomware. Several companies were hit, um, uh, continue to be hit quite regularly with, with a lot of these issues. Um, many of these companies have technophobic directors who feel that IT expenditure is a total waste of money. Um, you know, the whole issue of OSH and safety, the issue of strengthening security, moving from the watchman to a more professional type of arrangement. Otherwise you could find you're sending shipments into the US and suddenly, you know, you're finding cocaine in, in your products. And, and, and directors need to be aware that these are, are rising threats. Environmental liabilities, um, the whole issue of green, the green environment, uh, the green um, culture of an organization, ensuring that your raw materials and your products are in compliance with environmental standards. And quality systems. These are things that are moving goalposts, um, they, especially in the developed world. They're always um, changing quality standards. These are non-tariff barriers that are really designed to keep you out of the, out of the market. So, but my biggest issue, I think, with, with family-owned companies um, is the whole question of the human resource area and where independent directors can play an important role. In, in, um, in alerting the family with regard to the whole issue of forming a more professional organization, having the CEO delegate more, um, creating greater divisions of labor, um, the whole issue of compensation. We, we talked about that in the first session. How are we dealing with compensation? Um, are we being fair to family and non-family members? And I think the whole issue of internal and external equity is critical. Training at all levels, um, um, trade union issues and grievances, and because the company may start off small, but eventually gets so large that it becomes unionized. So how do we prepare the organization to deal with these issues? And the, whole, the critical issue of succession, which as ha has been stated, succession in a family business is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And therefore, there needs to be a focus at the level of the board and the organization needs to be prepped um, to ensure that there's constant focus on this so that um, we are ensuring that we don't end up in a situation whereby the third generation is waiting to take up their position in the company and they're just not prepared um, to do it because the preparation or the work has not been done before. So I just wanted to close there. I think that um, in terms of um, family businesses, um, I know that many of the boards are, are, are kept um, at the exclusive um, area of, of, of family members who are shareholders, but the degree to which independent directors can be brought in, and not just lawyers and accountants, but also other practitioners who have a broad experience in, in corporate governance, can help the company transition. Otherwise you may find, the company may find itself um, growing with, without improving its governance structures. And as a consequence, uh, faces levels of risk that could um, cause the company to crash um, and, and, and to the detriment of all um, who are employed and also owners. So with that, I, I, I close and I'm 
and uh, pass on to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to be with you all. I just wanted, um, you know, tough to make jokes on Zoom, but I, I do want to say a couple of things. One is that, uh, Suresh, if you still remember me as Sajiko, clearly I haven't sold you a Volvo as yet, so I'm going to have to, um, to work on that. And uh, I will be contacting you very shortly to take a test drive in a Volvo so that you can recognize me in the blue and orange of Massey as we go forward. Uh, I did spend a long time at, at Sajiko, though, so I'm glad that you still remember those days. Uh, it's also not such a great idea but to follow uh, on a panel somebody with the title of doctor because they usually are much more versed on the topic than you are. And as we as we talk about the issue of the topic, I know when when I first received an email from corporate governance, when, whenever I get an email from corporate governance, it's usually because I've done something that needs to be corrected in, in corporate governance in one of the companies. So this was a bit of an interesting uh, call for me to, to join a corporate governance conversation. And then, uh, you know, I mean, I'm really a corporate guy. Uh, as we said, Sajiko going into to, to Masi and, and both fairly large corporations in the Caribbean. So the issue of, of being a director in a family business, whether that was a, an area that I could add any value to, I questioned with Kamala. And then I re realized that the advice that she had gotten in terms of picking up on this had come from Annette. And, and understood maybe why I was being chosen there. And I do sit on a family board of a property company in Trinidad and, and that will remain nameless. But um, so I have some experience of actually being an external director in a family company that is quite interesting. I also have, a, and, and would share that I have a, quite a lot of experience in, in working with family companies. You know, when we are in the Massey Group, when we're acquiring businesses in Colombia or Panama or looking at different businesses, the interaction with the families that you know, most of these businesses would be family run companies. And, you know, you, you really see the differences in the, in the different stages that, that some fam family companies are, are at. So when you are, um, I think when you're dealing with a, a founder and an entrepreneur and that family business is, is still controlled fully by the, by the founder, it's much different that the founder is very clear on, on, on what he wants to do with the company, who he wants on his board, how he wants it to be run, how he wants it to be managed. And, and it's a very clear, definite position. And, and, and if you interact with them in either any, as, a, as an external director and or as a, as a partner or, or a customer, you get the flavor of that company coming from the founder. I think the challenges for, for family companies really develop after the founder is either getting older, starting to hand over the business to others, or the founder dies, and then you, you get a, a, a much different uh, complexity. So I, I've seen in, in some businesses now where you're in the second generation of, of, and the founders died, and, and you find that maybe one member of the family is is now the, the group CEO and, and, and other members of the family either work in lesser positions or don't work at all and benefit significantly from the organization. And that, that's usually quite a, a challenge for them, for family companies to have to deal with. One of the ways, I mean, where, where external directors play a, a big part in that is, is, is to bring, and, and my view of, of, of one of the things I agree with Ronald that, that you know, most family companies would end up hiring a lawyer or, or, or an accountant as an external director to give them advice, particularly the lawyers on, on the governance issues and, and how to, to set up the, the, the various, board, various boards and companies and uh, uh, such. But I also think that, that controlling the emotions in the, in, in the space of, of a family company is also a very important element of, of an external director role because one of the things that we've certainly learned in, in terms of the acquisition side of, of buying a family company, you always try to get the, farm, the boards to, to get an external uh, consultant or an external player to, to help them during the process because a lot of emotion is, is generated in, in, in family companies, particularly in the second generation where you know, the, the business would have been passed down by, by their dad and, and you know now they they are selling it and, and they they're responding to, to there's a there's an emotional connection to the company and, and the emotional connection to the value of the company that is is can be very complicated. 
So you, you know the need for for external consultants, external directors to control and, and not not control is a bad word, but but also to 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 just settle the, the organization down and to keep it on focus if it is in a in a, in a disposal mode is very important from a running the company point of view. And I mean the, the experience that I certainly have is is of a one of the founders of an organization that is still around but is getting older and is less involved and there are multiple uh, multiple family members participating on the board and and it's an interesting mix of move you know trying to, to to keep the company focused still using the valuable uh, experience of the founder and the, the knowledge of, of of the person involved and but allowing the, the, the children in the in the organization to to take charge and to be to be more decisive of, of, of what happens with the organization. And actually, so in some ways you, you can kind of sometimes as an external as an external director start to become a little bit of a counselor in in, in, in your relationship and in, with the families involved. So I I, I would take the conversation from a, a different viewpoint than, than Rollins' point, where we're much more of a governance, uh, you know, whether how you set up HSSE and how you set up safety committees or audit committee, but more along the lines of, of understanding what the, uh, what the family now wants out of the business and, and how, how you can manage your relationships in the family to, to get that, to achieve that. And I think that's a very is a is a critical part of it because you know, you know, as in any team, I mean, and Suresh, is, is, you certainly recognize this that that uh, in any team, you know, if all the players are on the same, you know, have the same goal and the same desires, it's usually a much more effective situation when they when they're people you know playing for themselves and 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 have an idea of what they want out of it as opposed to what the group or what the family should be getting out of it. It's a little more complicated, so I, I see the, the external director as as part um, part counselor, part guider, guidance counselor, part uh, you know the the, the the role that Rollin described clearly as well, where you you you're pushing a, a family to to make sure that they have uh, good governance in the organization around audit, around around legal requirements. You know, the, Normally, most family businesses, the, the secretary would either be the accountant or, or the corporate secretary would, would, would not be, they wouldn't put out the kind of money required for, for a trained corporate secretary to, to, to look after all the requirements of the organization. And that is a, that is a little bit of a, a wide statement. I mean, they're, they're, they're huge family companies, as, as we, we talked about in the first, um, in the first discussion where an organization that properly managed and, and so many other family companies that have become large and, and are now, I mean, extremely well managed. But I think the gist of the, of the general conversation that we wanted to have is around more developing uh, family companies where there is a need for, for better governance as opposed to, you know, entrenched family companies where where there, there is, they have now become corporate entities. You know, I mean, an example would be like an Ansel McCall, as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, you know, in 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 different, you know, in Belize. I mean, I I, I was very um, interested in the presentation earlier about the sort of the the, the tourist board um, for Belize because Belize. Uh, I have spent a lot of time. It's a very interesting place and a, and a nice country, and um, they do have a couple of big family companies there that that, that operate at a, at a very high level. Uh, so you know, I think our conversation, and I'm and I'm looking forward to handing back to the to the the audience for for some questions and comments on on the things that we're talking about. But I think our conversation is really about the development of, of family businesses rather than the fully developed ones. And uh, just to say that, that there is one company that in Brazil that I know of that actually have set up a governance structure where they have decided what they will do going into the third generation and that they, have, they will not allow third generation family members to become uh, executives of the company because they see that that is a, is a danger to the organization going forward. But this company has become very large and it's, it's, it's very interesting how you transition 
from a family-based managed company to a corporate entity. And I, I think there are many different ways to do that, but uh, everybody sort of comes up with their own, their own ideas. So I, I, I also am going to stop there, and um, I just want to recognize my chairman in this in this thing. So as you, we did, you know, you did say we don't know each other, but we have seen each other quite a lot the over over many years, and you were always a a, a very uh, yeah, charming uh, individual who would always say hello even when you were on the West Indies team, and it was nice to know that you would talk to us uh, minions when you were in that space. So I'm returning some of the uh, compliments that you gave us earlier that might may or may not be, uh, uh, you know, appropriate. So thank you <laughs> for, you for your comments. <laughs> and, um, I look forward to, to questions and 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 any um, conversation that we might have. I don't think everybody wants to sit and and, and let us just talk for for the whole, for the entire hour. So I look forward to having having a discussion with with the members of the audience. Thank you very much. Well. You know, even before we, we invite the audience to get involved, I don't know if um, Rollins will want to um, comment on anything that you would have commented on, David. Um, Rollin? No, no, I'm good. I, I, I'm i fine. I agree with him. Let's hear what um, people may have in terms of questions or comments. Right, so so you are free to, to, to begin to challenge these men and ask questions. But one of the things I uh, that is of interest to me, actually, is that um the the issue of power and influence that um, may arise with family members having independent directors on the board. Uh, how, how much of an issue is that? Because the more independent directors you have, there, there might be or there's a potential for members of the family feeling as though they're going to be relinquishing some measure of control over their business. How, how is that dealt with? If I could, I could jump in. Um, that that power dynamic is a real issue, um, and I think that that is why family business uh, boards are reluctant to to um, to invite too many independent external directors, and and I think that um, it it happens only when they realize that they they, they need to do it because the business is suffering. Um, rather than being proactive and, and spreading, uh, developing the governance structure um, in, in anticipation of the growth of the company. But that is, a, a, is something that external directors have to be aware of, that there is an important power dynamic. And you will notice that many, well, um, I don't know in terms of the statistics, but certainly the ones I've been exposed to, um, the family, the numbers of family members on the board always exceed the number of external directors on the board. And, and, and that is an indication of the, the, what is important in terms of the power dynamic. So when it comes to a vote, um, you know, the family uh, will prevail. So Suresh, I, 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 I think that's a, it's an interesting point, but it's also incumbent on, on external directors uh, to make sure that they're not trying to be in control yeah. and understanding their role. Their, their role on a, on a company board, a family company board, is, is to help, not to control. The family is in control of its business. And, and you have to be very careful. And, and I agree that, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I sit on very few boards where they have votes. So uh, we, we, we like to, to try and avoid that kind of conversation, right? So... I think it's important that, that, that external directors understand what their, their role is there and they're here to, to guide, they're here to support a family during, during a transition or during a period of, of growth. And it's not about control, certainly not for external directors and they should never participate in that type of, of, of activity, trying to control somebody else's company. Well, be that as it may, and, and I would want to agree with you, um, before I actually go to the chat, and there are a couple of questions here. Um, there's always the issue of, um, in situations like that you've described, David, where um, an independent director might suddenly think that, well, okay, I'm here for more decorations than for directions. And um, you know, to, to balance that, I think is, is, is gonna require a certain level of skill and maturity from those independent directors. What do you think? Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, certainly, um... One of the things that, as an external director, you could be there just yeah, just to, as a face, and I mean, 
if that is the case, you know, just make sure you get paid properly for it. <laughs> 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 and enjoy the ride because, you know, at the end of the day, the family has the right to do that. And I mean, if, if that is how you're going to spend your time, then, um, then, then certainly you, you, you're entitled to that as well. I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend that as an external director. I would recommend that you understand your role and, and try to play it properly. So, so here's a question for you guys. Um, you know, how do we get family members to consider external directors? And this, com this comes from Kamala. Um, well, in, in my experience, it, it, I think it, it comes, it evolves because the, they recognize that the um, organization is outgrowing the, the, the governance structure that they have which is a, a small group of family members who are shareholders. And um, they recognize that they need broader perspectives and, and <laughs> other perspectives on the board to, in order to grow the company going forward. Um, I, I think it arises out of necessity. Uh, um, now they may also be the family members who would have be, may have been exposed to um, corporate governance environments in other companies. For example, you may have a family member who's invited onto the board to serve on the board of a, another company, a, a much um, company that, that has much, uh, many more corporate structures and then appreciates the importance of these structures and therefore decides to come and replicate that in their own family business. So those could be some of the reasons. I don't know if other people have other experiences. Uh, another question. Sorry, go ahead, David. My apologies. Well, I just, I mean, I think as 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 the Caribbean uh, corporate governance body, in terms of you would an education for family businesses to to think about about external directors, it's, it's certainly something that they should be considering. But it it really has to do with the timing and the of where the organization <laughs> is at the time. I think that is critical. And sometimes what happens is is the family Mem um, company might have non-family members on the board, but those non-family members <laughs> might be employees. So you might have your sales director, or, your, or, your, or, or even if you have a CEO, and and that sometimes has a dynamic to it where those people are less likely to have independent positions, you know. And and even in in big companies, you have that same situation where you have executive directors and non-executive, and that's. And that's why this whole education of what a non-executive external director mm -hmm. is intended to bring to a company is very important. So I, I think it's, it's, it's an education process for families as to understanding the role of a non-executive uh, external director. Who, who then will be responsible for, for, for that educating? Because you have the challenge here where in family businesses, um, very often, especially those persons would have, you know, over the years, built their businesses from, from scratch, literally, they would have invested um, just about every type of resource necessary to make the business a success. Therefore, in terms of speaking about education and, and changing of mindset, it is in itself a, a, a gray area, you know, because depending on your, your, your family members and their, their strength of leadership, one may very well tell you, well, you know, how do you think I, I mean, let's, let, 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 let's take KFC, um, KC, for instance, 100 years of existence. They would have been through just about every imaginable situation over the 100 years. And um, could you imagine, and, and I wonder in, 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 in Roland's case, um, you know, with all, in spite of all his experience, you know, when he sits with them and chats, you know, it's about, um, you know, what are you going to tell us that is so different because we've been around 100 years, you know, and that education in itself uh, 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 with regards rules and function, I, that in itself might be such a huge challenge to surmount in the first instance. Yeah, you know, that, that is, not, I'm, not, I'm not speaking about someone within KC. I'm speaking about <laughs> someone, uh, you know, in Trinidad who has developed a very large um, enterprise. So I'm just su suggesting that um, there's a significant level of, of education. We spoke about it earlier in terms of getting um, um, family owned businesses to appreciate the importance of, of establishing good corporate governance structures and, and how that will allow the organization to continue going into the future. Otherwise, it may, as I say, crash after the third generation 
or during the third generation. Great. Well, I, we have Latoya and she has a hand up, but I know right now her hand has been so up for so long, she's probably building muscles, but I would have to ask her to hold on one bit because there's a question here earlier o'clock that came in from um, Tanika Wilson-Gabriel and the question is, um, um, what from your experience are the strategies that dependent external directors can use to influence family boards to get his or her voice heard while serving on those boards? Well, that's, I, I, I would like to, I mean, I'll jump in on that. You know, it, it seems like the, the conversation a lot of times is, is, is about influence or control or, or, or putting people. I, I think as an external director, you're really there to, to help the, the organization and to guide the organization. And, and, and so you, it, it's a conversation about what, what do you bring to the table in terms of, of helping people? They didn't ask you to join the board, not to listen to you. If, if, they, if they are in that space, I mean, they, they would like to hear from you. And I think you have to understand the dynamics of the company, the dynamics of the family, and, and understand what, it, what can be an emotional subject and, and how you put it across. And, I, and, and I, that's where, you know, I raised that topic in, 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 the, in the first part of my contribution where I was talking about the emotion of, of family businesses. And I think that's very important. I think in, in, and, and that's where I think the, the whole guidance counselor thing comes in, is you have, to, you have to understand the dynamics of the board, the family, and the family members, so that you could help, help people to see not necessarily your point of view, but the, but the point of view that would be best suited for the company. And it may not be yours. It may be that another member of the family is, is raising something that is not being heard. And your role would be more to, to help promote that than to pro promote your point of view. But your point of view may not necessarily be the one that, that you want to pre promote. Noted. Um, Latoya, my apologies for having <laughs> exercised your arm for so long. But... <laughs> <laughs> the benefit, the benefits of a virtual room. So <laughs> I rested while it was raised. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, panelists. Um, it wasn't so much as a question as it was to contribute to what both um, both Dr. Roland Bertrand and Mr. O'Brien were saying. And this is in relation to just getting the buy-in. So boards do need to have the benefit of education in corporate governance, and more importantly the benefit of seeing how, maybe not here at home, because we do have so many family-grown, multi, um, well, now multinational operations, um, but maybe looking internationally, looking a bit further to see how the benefit of independent directorships actually help to scale and grow businesses because of the expansion of expertise that if proper, properly utilized on a board, um, will give the directors and the family greater positioning in the future. So for instance, I mean, I am with Anson Car Limited and we have recently um, increased our independent directorship in a very directed way. It was a specific effort and a request that was made to push for an increase in independent directorship because there was already an understanding. And I've been with the company a little bit over four years, but I would have gotten in there when that understanding was already pretty prevalent that if we um, we always have a joke to him. If we drink our own Kool-Aid, we, we can only reach as far as the jug, right? So, I mean, the latter part is my addition. But if you drink your own juice, you're only going to be swimming in that same space constantly. And I think getting directors to appreciate that comes through corporate governance training, which for the most part should be led to a certain extent by the corporate secretary who understands the way that the business is meant to grow and the role of directors in terms of their contribution to the management of the business and the growth of the business over time. So it definitely might be a challenge where boards are in boards that are still very heavily family set, where the majority of directors aren't just employees that work for the company, but are also specifically family members. It might take some more time, but directed education and training and um, maybe even case studies. So not not a full-blown case study that you take years to prepare, but just examples that can be given to the directors of how the um, introduction of more independent and confidently independent directors. So directors who hold a significant power and weight in their own way, in their own industries, and in the, in the fields for which their expertise is required on the board, you have to find people who are willing to challenge. And you do have to internally get the buy-in 
for the benefits of that challenge. So that's all I wanted to contribute in terms of, you know, just getting directors to be on board <laughs> with the concept of introducing independence and then relying on it for the purpose of growth. No, to have, um, so if you don't mind. I, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, that's fine. So first of all, Latoya, my, my name is David, by the way, for everybody. I'm not Mr. O'Brien. I, I actually feel a little bit like a fraud because I, I want to pair shorts as well as this white shirt that we have on here. <laughs> <laughs> I really prefer to be called David. Um, I, I, no I, problem. I, I want to say that, you know, as, an, as any organization should be setting its, its plans, its strategies, its budgets together. So after the team, and that was the point I was making about the team conversation, that I, I don't think that any independent director should be driving the strategy of a business based on his opinion or her opinion. And, and, and it's very important that, that we recognize that, that the organization, when it sets its plan, everybody should have an input into it. But once those plans are set, then your role as an external is about supporting the management, supporting the family, supporting the executive on in their relationship with the families as to how they drive that organization forward as opposed to making your your opinion the one that everybody is following so I, I i think there's a time for opinion but it's during a discussion around strategy and budgets and and direction and and when when those are set then they're set in a particular way that we, that we, that we can move forward and i think that having independent directors who have extreme knowledge in a particular area is is very important for the setting of goals and directions but not necessarily for following their opinion exclusively. Agreed, agreed. If, if I could also um, comment about the whole issue of um, how you position yourself as an external director. Um, David suggests that one of um, counseling and supporting um, Within within the context of the of the law of, of 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 you know companies act law and the role of a director, you as an external director, once you are appointed to the board, you you um, in law are equal to those family members who are on the table with you. Um, and while I recognize that um, that that. You have to have a, a, a strategy for helping the organization go forward. Um, I don't think that you will necessarily add a lot of value if you simply see your role as um, as as being there to um, to to you know counsel and part fights. And I, I know David mentioned that you're not there for window dressing. If you're there for window dressing, you're wasting your time. But there is a there is a um, a spectrum there. There's a, a, an important um, um, uh, positioning in terms of you must not be too assertive and feel that you could control everything. But at the same time, I don't think you should be so laid back that you know you're just there almost window dressing, but but not quite. Otherwise, uh, you, your the, your ability to to influence the organization in terms of strengthening the role of the board and the corporate governance, which you know as an in independent director is critical for the future development of the company. You may find that that not taking place fast enough to keep track with how the company is growing. I don't know if, I just wanted to make that point. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I just want to read a couple of comments here on the chat. Um, Avia Linde said that uh, fascinating discourse so far, awesome presentation, thank you. Um, and Henry Gantium, uh, he, he's asking, you know, maybe there, there might be need for some more emphasis here. He says, I think that David's observation about the role of the independent director as a counselor to the family members um, merits emphasis on further comments. Um, I don't know in what specific area that he would want you to comment on, but. Um, Henry, you're also free to unmute your mic and, and, and chime in, you know, clarify a little bit more because that's, uh, it's quite broad really in terms of, um, you know, the, the area of discussion here. But I, I don't know, gentlemen, if you all want to add anything to that, right? That the role of the independent directors uh, as counselor needs some more uh, discussion. 
Well, let me, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, we're triggering a little conversation on this subject. So, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and le let me say that even in my, so, so my role as an executive, I, I sometimes feel that, that it, is, it is better for me as an, when, when an independent director on, on the Massey board is, is there for, for, for support and, and for guidance as opposed to giving, always suggesting that he has a better opinion than, than other people or, 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 or executives themselves who are deep in the business. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm adding the role of counselor. So I'm, I'm saying an independent director should always be supportive of the strategy of the company having it been, been decided. And, I, and adding a role in a family business where I believe that, that emotion is, 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 is much more present than in say a corporate entity. And, and I'm saying that that, that emotion uh, comes about to, so, and as I, in the context I was putting it with, say, say you're selling one of the businesses in, in a family business and, and the, the, the position about value or how much shares I have and what my, my you know, and, and that's where the independent director can support and counsel people into understanding that, that the process is more important than, than, than the feeling. So, so I, I'm just, I, I, I mean, I hear your point, Roland, and I agree with you 100% that as a director on a board, there, there are responsibilities that you have. And I believe those should be, should be exercised in, in the right way. But I think after that, there is a need for support, and, and, and in particular in family business. I would love to hear from, um, from Henry Peter, uh, his, his, his opinion on this. So I, I hope he does uh, unmute and come get involved. <laughs> I think a lot has to do whilst um, Henry comes on um, with, with, with really the family uh, members understanding where there are gaps uh, in the boardroom and that the persons that they invite to serve as independent directors brings to the table a certain measure of um, expertise and experience that closes this gap that exists, that doesn't, you, you know, um, that exists amongst the family members. And in that way, I think uh, if it is being done with that kind of uh, rationale, I think then that it, it makes conversation and the dynamics within the boardroom, right? Uh, a lot more dynamic and progressive and it's, it, it might mitigate the, um, the fears that one may have in terms of, you know, the independent directors and his or her role. All right, so Sir Rich, I see that uh, Mr. Gantum has unmuted, yes. so we'll invite him. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Yes. And I'm seeing as well after him, I would also ask, um, I'm seeing um, Dr. Hans, Rahel, hands is, hand is up as well. So after after he, he's finished, so go ahead, Henry. Yeah, where, where, where I was going, and I was teasing out, which um, I think um, picked up pretty well where I was aiming, and that is that. Um, I am suggesting, I'm happy to hear the experiences I had, that outside of those mundane, albeit important, quantitative measures, the budget, the cash flow, Warren spoke about that, et cetera, strategy, competition, IT. But in addition to that, the real soft and messy areas of family jealousies. We know it's a reality. Different mm -hmm. children in generation two will have different skills and aptitudes. And I think this is where I was heading in my own limited experience, and later I will touch on this this afternoon, that that counselor role, counselor inverted commas, migrates from the pure traditional board agenda but being a family, I use the Italian mafia term, conciliere, available for counseling, maybe completely outside of the boardroom, calling in son or daughter or spouse for a drink after work or a cup of tea one afternoon to have an exchange of views and maybe suggest we might calm some ruffled feathers if we did it this way. So this is where I was heading, David. I'm glad to get you pick it up again. <clears throat> yeah, well, absolutely, Peter. That that is that is exactly the context in which I was speaking. In that, you know, and Roland, I mean, having had the experience of sitting uh, as you do on both a family board and a, a corporate board, 
you know, there's very few instances in the corporate board where, because there are usually 10 or 12 professional hardened business people, both men and women who have been, you know, been through this before. So there are very few instances of any petty squabbles that might have been caused by I own more shares than you, or you own more shares than me, and or 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 an aging founder losing his power, uh, creating a, a a dynamic that is 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 difficult to to manage. So, in the family business, those things do occur, and and there are times, and I'm saying that that's when uh, uh, you know Peter brought up the conciliatory uh, conversation. That's when that. That's why you you sometimes ask to be on the board to, because you have a kind of a relationship with the family that that allows for you to to have that call after or or, or drink with the, the the board member. I think in family businesses it's an important role that and and not and I'm not diminishing the, the role of, of of paying attention to the cash flow and and forming an audit committee and and making sure there's the health and safety. Not not in any way. I'm just saying that this is a, an extra. Um, consideration, particularly in, in family companies. We acknowledge um, Dr. Annette Rahel, whose hand is up. And uh, that will be followed by Dale Parson, who will also make contributions. Go ahead. Thank you, Suraj. I won't be too long. I do want to say that a lot of times I try my best when I'm working with family businesses to keep the emotionality, as, as David uh, so aptly put it, in another forum and the family governance aspect of it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my session. And I do want to endorse what both Peter and David are saying about the mediator role, as it were, of uh, external director. Roland, you're perfectly correct. And, and there are things that we need to consider in terms of professionalizing, although I don't like that word, but in terms of raising the level of the, the business. Uh, but the, we also, when we're looking for external direct, directors in a family business, we are looking for a bit of wisdom, as it will, a bit of experience in uh, maneuvering to, to David's uh, point about a relationship, people that know the, uh, something about the family. And when later on, when Dr. When Marguerite speaks about onboarding, for me, one of the most critical things for an external director is to get to know all the stakeholders in the family, whether they're serving on the board or not. So I like to encourage external directors to meet. I try to get my family to say, have a session or two with the external board directors and the entire family forum, just so that there's comfort level. These external directors are not doing one of two things, hijacking the company, which they never do. David is spot on. They're not gonna let you do it anyway. So you're very right not even to attempt to do it. So that not only are they not hijacking the company, but they're not in uh, somebody's corner and that they're seen as very impartial. So that's my little two cents. Deal? Yeah, Deal here. Sorry. So my experience is, um, my experience at, has, has been at Kaleidoscope, at Kaleidoscope, and I can only speak um, about um, our experience here. I am second generation. Um, the, my father was the founder 50 years ago, and um, I came in um, straight out of UE, <clears throat> being the youngest in the family, and um, having to, to, he wanted me to become um, the CEO of the business at that time, and um, my siblings are all 10 years plus older than me, but they all worked with him because they never went to school or anything like that. They came straight from um, secondary school into, into the business with him, helping him and so on. What I can say is, um, is, it, is that the challenge has been with family business um, to get the, the, the family members to agree to bring in external directors because I don't think they recognize that um, the importance of, um, of having external people advising the family on how the business should be run. There's a lot of emotions that are tied up in family businesses. And, um, and I'm speaking from experience that cloud the focus and the judgment of which the, the, the business should be taking, the strategic direction the business should be taking. Because when you reach a business of our size, um, which I would call medium to large, um, 
you, you start to realize that there are only one or two of, of, of the family members who recognize that the business must have a strategy. And it is not about blaming one another, but bringing in these external people. And, and, and rightfully so, we need to are coming out. If one thing comes out of this, um, this corporate governance week of webinars is that we should um, embark on a campaign to educate the, the small and medium businesses in Trinidad, which comprise of 80 to 90 percent of the businesses in Trinidad, to please bring in external advisors or external directors onto your board. That is the only way that the business will have any kind of focus. And this is me speaking from experience. I, I also agree with David about that Brazilian company. Um, he said that the third generation, there'll be no um, family members on the board, on, on, on the board of directors. And, and I just want to um, emphasize that that is so, so important because bringing in, if you want succession and perpetuity in your business for, for long-term growth, you need the second generation, which I am in, need to really plan the, plant the foundation for the third generation and set the record straight. Otherwise, the business usually crumbles by the time it reaches the third generation. If you don't have external professionals, whether they are retired people acting in a consultancy role or full-time working directors, and I, I have an issue with full-time working directors too because full-time working directors become um, either um, someone who will always side with the CEO or whoever bring him in, that external director. So I prefer to have external um, um, directors who are not full-time to advise on the board and advise the family members and the shareholders what, and what, sh what should be and should not be done in, an, in a rational and unemotional way. In addition to that, <clears throat> just to add to what um, Rollins had said, doc, Dr. Rollins had said, I would also recommend that these external directors be, if, if they are not fully involved in the business on a day-to-day -day running with a desk and so on in the office, and they are coming once a week or twice a week or by phone call or by Zoom or whatever, Teams or whatever, that they at least interact with um, with senior managers in the business to just to follow up on projects and um, strategic initiatives that might have been st started in, in, in during one of the uh, board meetings, because that is so important. It is not only counseling, but also reaching one step further and not just sitting in a board because sitting in a board, you, after you sit in a board, no action comes out of that unless that external advisor reaches, penetrates to a certain depth into the senior management of the organization and find out, okay, how is this new software program going on? Or how is this new um, product development coming on? And, and these external people should, be, should have a specific skill set aligned to the speciality of the business. So if the business is banking, well, then you need somebody in risk management. You need somebody in, um, in, 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 in different aspects. It was somebody in finance, somebody, if the business is manufacturing like ours, it should be specific. One external advisor or director should be specific um, towards manufacturing and operations. Our next one should be finance. And the next one should be sales and export, for example. Um, I am I'm really, really worried because I think that a lot of the family businesses um, that are here today will not be here for um, the next 20 years because they are rich a certain, um, they are rich second generation and, and the father or the founder will pass away. And when that happens, the children, the second generation are gonna fight and they don't know what to do. Um, so we really need to embark on some kind of campaign coming out of this week long webinar that, and this is the third one I've been invited to speak at. And by the way, I, I, I have also been asked to sit on several external boards, which I've declined because I'm so involved in this business. 
I'm also the vice president elected of TTMA. I've been asked to come onto so many other boards because people don't, people recognize what I see as, 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 as how proper corporate, corporate governance should be run. Um, thank you all for, my, for, that, uh, for listening to my contribution. Thanks very much, Dale. Uh, a lot there, you know, the succession planning is real important and the grooming, development, mentoring, I think that is something that families need to look at carefully. Gentlemen, your thoughts on, on, on Dale's contribution? Well, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well uh, well, while he was speaking about the third generation, um, I, I reflected on Nigel's initial comment about um, the lack of stress. Um, and that is something without, you know, um, being too detailed about it um, with regard to the third generation and the fact that they have been, um, they have come into the world into a family that has established, well-established, and they have not faced the stresses of their four uh, parents and the grandfathers who, and uh, grandparents who set up the business. And that stress, that absence of stress has given a sense of entitlement um, to the business um, that is not necessarily matched with um, competence and drive and and, and, and an ability to take the, the organization forward. And the whole question is, as the question has been put to me, what program can we put this third generation through to, to prepare them? If they're not ready now, how can we prepare them in the next five to seven years? But how do we, pre I, I don't think education enough is, is enough. I've heard views that are maybe they need to go and work um, in other organizations so that they come out of the comfort of the family um, environment. Um, but that is a very difficult issue um, in terms of resolving. How do we prepare these, this third generation who have a very high dose of entitlement? I, I, I want to say, um, I know there was an earlier question uh, Suresh, uh, where someone asked, how do we get uh, family businesses to, to adopt this culture? In the, well, I, I think you just got your answer, which is, I, I think this is recorded, so they could use Dale's comments on a continuous basis and send that to all family companies. So Dale just made an extremely powerful case for a family. And, and coming from someone who is in the experience of it, I mean, is extremely powerful. So I, I thought that his comments were, were spot on and, 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 how, and how important it is, you know, and, and his experience, I could hear his experience of being the youngest member of the family being made the CEO, how that would have, have required some level of management and, and, and it's clear that they've done a, a great job of doing that. So I, I think that that in itself is, is, is a great place and, and to, to start selling this, this idea. Uh, and, and then, you know, Rollins, I, I agree with your point that, you know, this idea of the third generation of, of, of families, I mean, the, the old story of the, the first guy works for it, the second guy benefits from it, and the, and the third guy blows it. So, you know, that's, that's been around for a long time. And the reason why these things last is because usually they're true. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with, with, with the need for, for stress. And also just for Dale, uh, one of the experiences I think that is critical for family businesses in terms of an independent director is somebody who understands growth and development of businesses. So how to grow and, and usually grow beyond the, 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 the existing markets that they, they operate in because, you know, that, that to me is a, is a big challenge for all, for all organizations, but particularly for family businesses. How do you grow when your family is, is limited in its, in, in its people or scope? So add that to the list of, of, of engineers and, and others. <laughs> I'm seeing a, a, a comment here from, from Andrew Govaya. On the point of preparing the younger generations, it's been my experience that these generations work in either banking or consultancy firms to gain the relative experience as quickly as possible before returning to the family business. 
This is usually between the age of 21 to 30. I have seen this in most of Latin America and with some friends in Europe and North America. Interesting indeed. Um, I just want to just shift slightly um, to the, the aspect of um, culture and structure within the framework of family-run businesses and how in terms of uh, uh, that formal and informal relationship, um, how is that managed in, given the fact that, you know, the dynamics of today's world, um, the rigidity in some cases of um, decision making and, and, and when you bring in new ideas and new personnel, independent directors and, and, and independent thinking, you're going to get new ideas on the table, right? But how, how do we manage the changing of the culture? Um, where things might be done family-wise in a very informal way, but when you bring in new directors, you, you tend to now bring in a lot more rigidity and formalities. How do you balance that? Do you really want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to, I just, I just don't, I, I'm, I'm not, I can't be in the space that, that bringing in external directors is about rigidity and, and, and formality. I, I, that's, that's not who I am. So I, I have real difficulty with that. I don't think that's what external directors should bring to the table. I, I think that businesses thrive based on creativity and, and, and that informality sure. that yeah. you, you mentioned and, 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 and the entrepreneurial drive of, of, of the owners. So for, if an external director is coming in there to bring rigidity, and then I think you have the wrong person. I, I think we really need to expand the capacity of, of the family, mm -hmm. to expand their, their, their creative and, and, and entrepreneurial thinking. And, 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 and so in, in my mind, you know, business should never be about rigidity. No business. It should always be about flexibility and, and growth and, and, and opportunity. So, so, so Suresh, I, I just, I just want to say that that to me is where, and, and I think that's what the, the point Dale was making is that people who come into this business should be coming in to help build it, not, not, not to put a shackle on, 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 the, on the youngest member of the family, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, I mean, um, and, and I'm happy that, Go ahead. If I may, if I, maybe the term rigidity was the, was not the uh, the right word, but um, certainly I think that family businesses do need some sort of um, you need to ha help them um, codify structure, cr create structures that make what they do more efficient. Um, for I, I think you know that has been my experience. You see. Um, how decisions are made with respect to investments. For example, you know, they, they you know, one of the directors say, you know, they have a warehouse up the road. Why we don't buy it? Um, okay, you know, we could do that. Um, we could go and buy it, or we could we could put a um, put it through a, a decision making process that um, that that looks at cost and. Uh, future cash flows and that kind of thing. So I think that there is a need for external directors to help support the entrepreneurial spirit of the company with um, structures and systems that we bring from the corporate world and not to make it rigid and hold them back, but to provide support going forward. Yeah, it, it's a fine balance. And, and um, you know, I, I think really that the whole culture of the organization, because you have the tendency amongst family members to, to just do, the, do things off the cuff and um, things may change, especially when new family members are brought into the picture. And uh, Roland, you made a point there that, you know, um, about the younger generation and the, the heavy dose of entitlement. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tricky one indeed. Something that really needs, you know, a lot of pondering. Yeah. So um, I'm seeing a comment here from um from Annette, and she's saying that um, and I hope she doesn't mind me using her first name. Uh, governance requires some process and structures, and sure, external directors can help in this regard. And we do need to strike a balance between process and what David terms creativity. 
Um, and then um, Kamla is suggesting as well, uh, actually a question. Yeah. Um, how do you behave as an external director when family conflict is occurring in front of you? I guess you shut your mouth. <laughs> 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 no, absolutely not. Actually, is the opposite because <laughs> I think I think where um, Rollins was going with rigidity is um, there must be a certain amount of discipline in the boardroom, okay? And if there's no discipline, I mean, discipline is something. First of all, yeah. When I was talking about training um, um, or, or campaigning for family businesses to uh, to have external directors, they have to want to have it. If they don't want to have it, they will not listen. So, I mean, being an external director like, like David or Rollin in KC, um, first and foremost, the, the family members have to want to have these guys here. If they don't want it, then first, they don't have a common goal for the business to grow. And, and that is of serious concern because then those family members may have to step down or they may be some, somebody will have to tell them that they will have to you know, step aside and, and leave the business to, um, to, to evolve and grow. Um, so having said that, once they, once they agree to have external people, there must be a strategic direction and a roadmap for the business to follow. So it's not just to go down the road and see a warehouse and say, you want to buy it. If that does not follow the strategic direction of the business, well, then why do it? I mean, that is not going to help the business grow at all. If you have a challenge in your organization where you can't have Forex or so um, to buy your raw materials and you need to redirect a lot of human resources and effort towards export. And that is, that is the direction that we should be taking to earn our own export. Well, then, you know, putting on a warehouse um, or buying a warehouse somewhere is not necessarily going to help that, that business grow. I mean, it, it really goes down to, you know, onboarding of the family members um, to have an external directors. And that's what I was talking about the campaigning because Trust me, there are about 80 or 90% of the businesses in Trinidad and I've interacted with a lot of small and medium businesses being at TTMA um, for the past three years. Trying to get these people to understand how to grow the business is a real challenge. And, and because first and foremost, they don't want to take the advice and, and it is for their own good because you know I have no horse in that race. So, um, once, once it is established by the family members that they want the external directors and, and they, 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 the, the, the external directors have the family build a strategic direction and a roadmap, um, I see no reason why you know, there, should, there should be any um, loss, of, loss, loss of way in following that roadmap unless the external environment changes such as COVID or something like that. So, so I, I, I want to say uh, that being in a corporate governance conversation, I, I certainly support structure and organizational uh, discipline. <laughs> and, and at no time am I suggesting that those, I, I think our businesses is at the best when it gets to the point where those are normal behaviors, right? right? So that, and that, so what I'm saying is, yes, we, we certainly, if they are family businesses that do not have those, yes, they absolutely have to have, uh, proper board meetings, proper proper structures, proper minutes, proper audit committee, proper review of financials, and and along with that, there needs to be the understanding of the family dynamic, the creative, the need for creativity, need for growth, because there, I mean, and growth is, is is an important part of business because if it's not growing, it's doing something else, and and then the family gets even more emotional if it's not going in the right direction. So, so I, I, I certainly support the, all the comments around, around structures and, and, and process. Don't, don't, please don't, don't. And that's one of the reasons why I said at the first beginning, that when I got the email from corporate governance, I wondered if it was somebody calling. Me <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. I've seen a comment here from Safia Johnson that I want to read as well. Um, she's saying here that the, um, I had to step away a bit, but a major challenge in family-owned business is intergenerational conflicts. The older generations that build a business from scratch to create a legacy versus the younger generation who believe that the business needs to modernize approaches and methodologies. Having been an advisor to family-owned businesses, there were attempts to get me to side with one generation or the next. What is your take on this? 
not sure if this was raised earlier. Yeah. I, I, I think it was raised earlier. <laughs> I, those are certainly one of the, that that is the that is the conversation I think we've had about about yes. the counseling part and 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 certainly yeah when when the generation changes and and you need to encourage you, the younger generation in the, in the conversation about modernization but recognize that the the, the older generation has has the right to hold on to their, their success and their and their beliefs uh, because they're the ones who did it and they're the ones who put it in the place that it is and and and, and that becomes where the counseling role I think is is, is critical. I, I guess that too would would, would kind of um, mesh into that role of um, grooming, mentoring, succession planning. You know, to, to transition from one era to the next. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, anyone else with any comments or questions? We are winding yes. down. We've got a couple yeah. minutes again. Thank you. I was about to point that out. It's um, 2.25, so it would be just about time for a wrap-up. There is a comment yep. from John Avanos, so you may want to read it and then um, Yes. It says, uh, one challenge in family-owned business is the understanding of how the law often applies to the financial side of the business. Right. So that's expert advice that they will need to bring in, which was something yeah, that, that was emphasized um, earlier. Okay, um, do we have uh, Dr. Bertrand on? Because I think his internet was given some yeah. trouble. Yeah, sorry, it, it dropped off for, for a few minutes. I apologize. Yeah. Okay, but I just wanted to share with you guys that I got a comment um, privately that this has been one of the best sessions yet. And that's a high compliment because we have had some really, really amazing presentations for Governance Week so far. But, um, you know, it, 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 this particular presentation, I think, has been um, really good and the discussion is so rich and there's so much that we do need to get out um, for family-owned businesses. But, Suraj, I'm not taking over your role. Uh, just please, please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll pass it back to you to invite our panelists to give their um their their closing comments or uh, you know two minute wrap up kind of thing um before we we bring the session to an end formally. David, you David, you first. <laughs> no, it's, um, well, let, let me say that if, if this was at all an interesting session, I think it has to do a lot with our chairman who, who did a, a great job of uh, introducing us and in such a powerful way. I mean, I didn't even recognize who I was. I wasn't, I think he was already introducing Roland, but um, so, so yeah, and, and for being such a, a, a gracious uh, host, so, uh, chairman, thank you for your guidance and, and support um, and the audience for participating. Uh, it's always good when on these, and, and you know, these, these Zoom sessions, you, you sometimes feel a little alone out there. So um, it, it was nice to have everybody participate and, and thank everybody for, for joining in. I, th I think as a wrap up comment, just to say that absolutely we need, we need uh, business, family businesses to develop more structure, more organization, more governance, more process. And, 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 and we certainly as an organization, we, this, this organization can, can help with that. Uh, but we also need to find ways to, to, to develop the creative entrepreneurial side of, of family businesses and, and get a, and, and help the families to work together and with each other for to the benefit of the business. Because and 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 we also need to be more proud of, of, of our families, you know. And, and this is more of a Trinidad comment. I mean, I there, there are quite a few Trinidadians on the call. So that you know we need to we need to be much prouder of, of who the families are that build these these businesses and, and, and recognize them for their, for their strengths and their qualities in our society. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we don't do that. We don't do enough of that. There's so many fantastic businesses that were built by families in, in, in our Caribbean context. And, and nobody, you know, we don't, we don't allow for, 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 the, for the bigging up, as we say, of the family members and the, and the, and the entrepreneurs that started it all. So I, I really think that that is an important part of the conversation. Thank you. Well, David, you've certainly enriched the session. So we want to say a special thanks as well. And, you know, it really a, a pleasure relating um, with you on, on, on this level and this sort of forum. Real somebody, somebody will be calling you about a Volvo soon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks very much. I, you know, I, I always look forward to a, a, a complimentary Volvo. So here, here might be the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a million, David. Really great catching up with you and all the best. Huh? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <clears throat> Let's not forget to get our closing remarks from Dr. Bertrand. Okay, I just want to thank you very much for, for having me. And I, I also want to endorse David's comments about participation and was very well organized. And I appreciate the comments from um, those who participated. I also want to endorse his view about the family. You know, coming to KC was a real eye opener. This is a company a hundred years old, started by, you know, Pa and Ma, under their house with a coal pot, cutting um, confectionery with a, knife, a pair of scissors and going on a bicycle and, and selling their products all over Trinidad. Now this is a company that, you know, 70% of its production is exported, you know, and it's, it's incredible. Most people who come through the, the, the door here, I am underneath the, you know, where, where it used to be the family house and when you walk into this factory, you see a, a very modern, one of the largest confectionery businesses in, in the Caribbean. So we don't give enough credit to those who walk that hard road. And, and, and while I say that, I also recognize that for this company to go another hundred years, they need the inputs of, of independent external directors who could help professionalize the organization and ensure it is around for a lot longer. So I want to thank you all very much and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Well, you know, Roland, thanks very much. You know, when you said that um, getting the KC was an eye opener, I thought you were going to say starting at KFC, KFC, um, at KC suddenly made life sweeter. But um... <laughs> that's a tagline, line, by the way. Good books, though. But no, thanks, Emil. You know, you guys have generally uh, made the session what it what it is and, and the comments that have been echoed, the sentiments have been due to the fact that you all have been as engaging as you all have been and, and the kind of knowledge and experiences shared I'm sure is what would have made this such an enriched session. So I wanna say a special thank you and also to all the participants. Uh, we really do appreciate you, your um, attend, attendance uh, at this session and uh, the Kamla and the leaders at uh, CCGI. Thank you all so very much. Keep up the good work. And God blessings to you all. Let's continue to keep safe. Uh, I'll hand over to Kams to say um, the last few words. And, um, you know, I, oper I operate like if this is my home, you know, where my wife has the last say. So, Kamla, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarich. Okay, yes, let me also express my appreciation to this panel. You know, it was the first time we had Mr. David O'Brien uh, able to join us. And I'm so happy that he also um, held on to his commitment to us, although he is all the way in Georgia right now. Um, you know, similar to Liz this morning, who uh, committed to us and then found she had to be in Belize, but still, you know, maintain her commitment. And Dr. Bertrand, thank you so much. I know that th this is a new area for you to come in and share um, with us. But uh, as uh, Dr. Rahal and so many others have said, you know, this has been really such a good session. Um, and it's 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 something that's going to even help us at CCGI understand what we need to know if we are going to help make a difference as well. So thank you all so much.